Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's Webinar Express, New Product Development in a Virtual World, which has been organized by the CIM Higher and Further Education Group. So I'd now like to hand you over to David Smith, who is our guest speaker today. Over to you, David. Great. Thanks very much, Yusuf. And hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. It's uh, really good to have you here. And I hope that you find this session interesting. Um, I found it really interesting in the preparation of it. Um, I'll just start by introducing myself. So my name is David Smith and I'm the head of marketing at the University of East London. I've got over 15 years experience in education, marketing and communications, and that's primarily in the London higher education institutes. Uh, my experience in HE is quite broad. It's from brand management to campaigns, market insight, research, strategic positioning and portfolio development. And obviously portfolio development is gonna be a key focus of what we're talking about here today. For those of you that don't know the University of East London, you might not be surprised to hear that we are a university in East London, um, but you might not know that we were established in 1898 as the West Ham Technical Institute. So we've got quite a rich and uh, deeply rooted heritage in our local community. We're now a forward thinking university with an ambitious vision. We essentially prepare our students for careers of the future. So we support them to develop the skills, the emotional intelligence and creativity to thrive in a constantly changing world. And that vision was actually introduced back in 2018 um, in the context of the impact of technology on careers and industry of the future. But actually since the pandemic, our, our vision has become a lot more uh, relevant as change and uncertainty are more prevalent in everyday life. And I'm really proud to be part of such an ambitious and inclusive institution and equally proud to be part of the amazing award-winning marketing team at the University of East London. So we were recently named uh, Marketing Team of the, year, of the Year at the Heist Awards. And for those of you that don't know, the Heist Awards are the, uh, the, the higher education sector awards. Um, and in terms of um, other, other accolades, we were also shortlisted as the only education brand uh, for Marketing Team of the Year at the most recent CIM Marketing Excellence Awards. So I'm now gonna turn my uh, camera off, uh, partly so that you can enjoy uh, the slides in, in, in full glory of, of, of the full screen, but also to give my Wi-Fi a fighting chance to make it through. Uh, I will turn my camera back on at the end. So just going over what we're gonna cover today, and it really is within the context of the global pandemic, as I think the, the title of this session uh, will have suggested, um, that's gonna be the backdrop. And I'm gonna be using examples from higher education and beyond and talking about how organizations have adapted their product portfolios in response to the pandemic and lockdown restrictions, what lessons have been learned and how these can be applied to the way that we operate as we transition back to the new normal, and what will be the opportunities and the challenges that lay ahead. And I'll be using the theme of the acceleration of digital transformation and product innovation as I work through these points, looking at the opportunities that the pandemic has presented organizations and how this has been used as a platform to innovate where perhaps traditionally risk adverse organizations might have otherwise lacked the appetite or the culture for change. So looking at product development, and I want to start with a, a definition, and this is a relatively uh, simple one. Uh, new product development is the transformation of a market opportunity into a product available for sale. And I'm going to take a relatively glass half full position on this one and say that the pandemic, whilst it's been extremely challenging for businesses, it's also meant that they've had the opportunity um, to, to develop and adapt their product offer uh, because life has continued to go on. Um, and obviously there's been a, a need for, for, for them to continue to trade as, as organisations, as biz businesses in that time. I also wanted to look at the different types of uh, new product development, and I think this is an important distinction that we look at before we go into the detail of the presentation. So new product development can be bringing a new product to a market. It can be renewing an existing product, and this is going to be very much the focus of uh, this session because obviously the pandemic um, gave us all that opportunity or, or challenge um, to look at the way that we were taking our products to market and the way that consumers were consuming our products in a, a very different world. And also um, new product develop development can be intro introducing a product into a new market and this is another theme that I'm going to touch on um, as we go through the session. So to, to look at the pandemic and I just wanted to take a, a few minutes to 
go over and remind us of the, the main factors that have impacted business in the short term because of the pandemic. And I think um, one of them has been the lockdown and the practical barriers of delivery. So people haven't been able to leave their homes. Uh, they've not had access to the products and the services in the same way that they did pre-pandemic. Uh, businesses have been forced to close their doors or find other ways of bringing products to market. And there's also been the financial implications of the pandemic. So people have been spending less, whether that's because they've got less disposable income or they've chosen to spend less because of uncertainty in the economic climate. Um, there have been some, some industries, some areas that have um, seen increases over the last 12 months. Uh, groceries, alcohol, books, for example, have, have all seen growth in that time. But um, I think more broadly, there have been a lot of challenges for business and companies have had to um, really respond to, to some challenging situations. So I want to start um, looking at some examples of how businesses have responded to the pandemic and how they have approached new product development during that time. And the first example I want to draw on is um, from the restaurant industry. And this has obviously been one of the, the biggest impacted areas. Um, because their restaurants have essentially been closed. And I think there's been two um, broad responses to that. One is that restaurants have pivoted uh, to the delivery and takeaway model. So many fast food outlets will have already been exploring that as a revenue, revenue stream prior to the pandemic with the emergence of online food order and delivery services such as Just Eat, Deliveroo and Uber Eats. Um, but the pandemic really meant that they had to fully focus on that as, as their main business um, income. Other restaurants have uh, needed to close down completely. So those high street chains, those slightly higher end restaurants that perhaps can't adapt their food preparation times and their product offer to the delivery model completely closed their doors. And I think taking uh, one of the biggest brands um, in, in the restaurant industry, McDonald's, um, and looking at what they did, so after the initial closure for them, so they decided in, in March when the full lockdown hit to close down completely, they started to open up and started to do that home delivery. And they were already in a good position because they had launched uh, their muck delivery service um, in the UK in partnership with Uber Eats back in 2017. And that had had some traction, but it was a smaller part of their business. The pandemic really allowed them to expand that and to focus on that as their online offer. Um, they, they opened up their reach to also include partnerships with Just Eat. And now, actually, in terms of sales, um, they're back above pre-COVID levels. So despite all of the restrictions being in place, McDonald's have managed to, to pivot to this new model of, um, of product offer and, and build their business, which is really quite, um, quite impressive. Another example from the uh, restaurant industry that I want to um, go through is Coat at Home. And this, this image hopefully tantalizing your taste buds on a, on a Thursday um, lunchtime. Um, so Coat is a French themed restaurant and it's been um, during the pandemic given its customers access to many of its dishes and products that have been sold in its restaurant at their homes. This is actually a slightly different model to the one that we've seen in the fast food chains and that online delivery and ordering service because they're not essentially delivering freshly cooked meals, they're delivering ingredients for their customers to cook at home. So I think it's really interesting because it's a slightly different take on what the rest of the sector was doing at the time. I think it's really interesting from the perspective of brand as well, because it still allowed them to maintain what's important to them, which is the quality of their food. And it's given us, um, the, the customers, and full disclosure here, I have um, used this service and, and enjoyed it very much. It's given us a different option um, other than being left to our own devices to cook, which if you're anything like me in the kitchen isn't a good option because I'm not very good at cooking. And the other option being the, the array of fast food uh, takeaways, which for me got very boring quite quickly as we went through um, lockdown so i think this was a, a really interesting example i think for the chain it gave them a new revenue stream in the short term not something that was going to um, replace the loss of the the physical restaurants that they'd seen but something that had at least given them a supplementary revenue and something that hopefully they'll be carrying forward as they open up their restaurants and i think that it kept them front of mind to their customers and hopefully encouraged their customers to return to their restaurants when they open Another hugely impacted industry that I want to look at is um, air travel. So as we know, flights were grounded, travel and tourism had stopped for many, many months. 
And airlines had no other option but to cease trading in most cases. But there are a few examples um, of how some airlines have used the time during uh, lockdown to, to innovate and look at their product offer. So the first example that I want to look at is Qantas. So they're an Australian airline. And back in October 2020, um, they started to offer a flight to nowhere. So uh, customers got onto their flight. It took off from Sydney. It was a seven hour round trip going over Byron Bay, the Gold Coast, the Great Barrier Reef, and then landing back in exactly the same place. Um, the cost of this was around 500 pounds to 2000 pounds. So it was um, uh, relatively expensive for essentially going nowhere. And I think broadly, this was seen as a bit of a gimmick. Um, they, they didn't scale this up. It wasn't a, a big revenue um, generator for them. But I think that what it did do was um, it gained a lot of press coverage when there possibly wasn't a lot of press coverage around um, airlines. It also kept their customers front of mind and showed that they were thinking about their customers and um, the people that went on the flight were very happy to have done something that was a bit different and got an element of travel back into their lives. Another example that I want to touch on from the uh, airline industry is Finnair. So Finnair is the, um, the airline in Finland. And um, during the Christmas period, they started to offer virtual holiday flights. So essentially, it was a virtual flight which uh, customers could, um, could experience, could engage with on their laptops, on their phones, view, through virtual reality headsets. Um, they could experience uh, a flight, an element of a flight, look around that in virtual reality. It lands in Lapland and they get to, to visit Santa at the end. So I was served this um, opportunity actually as an ad um, back over the Christmas time. And I think it was because I had been searching for uh, Santa visits for my daughter. So I think from that perspective, it's actually quite a good piece of digital targeting. But from a strategic point of view, I think for Finnair, it wasn't about income generation because the flights only cost 10 euros and all of the profits went to fund um, to UNICEF's fund for children who were adversely impacted by the pandemic. For Finnair, it's more about taking the opportunity to reach a wider audience and tie its brand into the festive period and to Finland and the home of Santa. And I think that it's a really interesting one from the uh, perspective of virtual reality, because virtual reality really is, is, is a growing area beyond gaming. And it shows how the pandemic allowed um, the brand and, um, and Finnair to really look at product innovation in, in the virtual space. I think that this could possibly be seen as a bit of a gimmick, but for me, it's slightly more meaningful than the Qantas example. And I know that for Finnair, they actually see this as part of their product extension going forward. Um, they've, they've cited this as being something that they're going to carry forward after the pandemic. And that's by no means saying that people are going to stop traveling and, um, and continue to do it virtually. But I think that this will complement the physical travel, um, allowing customers to virtually visit destinations that they're looking to book or virtually experience some of um, Finnair's um, service features, so their flights um, and their in-flight in facilities. So I think it's an interesting example from digital innovation, but also an interesting example from the perspective of strategic alignment and product extension. So I'm going to switch back now to higher education and the sector that I work in and look at how the pandemic impacted uh, us. So broadly, we went from this, so lots of students in, in lecture theatres, students on campus, in classrooms, to this, uh, students on their own, in their rooms, on laptops. And I think this is probably uh, quite uh, a common picture for a lot of people, uh, not only students, but workers as well. And, you know, ourselves at the moment um, uh, experienced in this as well. So due to the nature of products um, in higher education, which are courses, um, which are consumed for a long period of time we had a commitment to support our students um, to complete their studies so we had students that perhaps were in the final stages of their degrees and really wanted to complete those degrees um, and to, to build on the hard work that they've put in we had students that were earlier on in their degrees who were or had already started that journey and were looking to complete their, their learning journey as well so for us, uh, we were fortunate enough to have a product that could be moved um, completely online. And that's what universities did. Um, but it did present us with significant challenges. Uh, first of all, there were varying degrees of virtual course delivery across different institutions. 
some institutions would have had experience offering online degrees and had quite sophisticated virtual learning environments. Others are more um, traditional setups and they would have found that pivot to online um, to be a much bigger, bigger challenge from a technological and logistical point of view, um, not to mention cultural point of view. There were also challenges in terms of access to, um, to, to hardware and to internet connections as well. So in a recent JISC student digital experience insights survey, we know that 93% of students said that they had their own laptop. So the majority of uh, students would have been ready to, to set themselves up for online learning. But actually it shows that there were still some students that wouldn't have been able to, to transition straight away onto online learning. And I think that that would have been disproportionately weighted towards certain demographics um, and certain universities. So a challenge there just in terms of getting students set up to learn online. Um, I think there's also the challenge of there being um, a differences in courses as well in higher education. So some courses lend themselves better to online learning than others. Some have that kind of practical lab based um, element to them, which may means that learning online might not have been as simple as uh, another course, which um, is more lecture based. And also student expectations was a big challenge for us as well. So um, when students started their degrees, certainly um, their expectations of higher education went beyond lessons and learning. There's the support services, um, social activities um, are all very key to the student experience. And then of course, there's the challenge um, of universities uh, having to adapt their delivery at the same time as having themselves to navigate the challenges of, of lockdown and the pandemic. And as all of us will know, um, it was an extremely um, unsettling and scary time. I think that um, we had to work out how to adapt ourselves to working remotely at the same time as working to support uh, students uh, to get online as well. And I think there were some real challenges there. I think from a, a staff point of view, um, certainly to, to manage that um, anxiety of, of everything that was happening, um, health issues of staff as well, uh, the technical setup of them at home, and also the, um, the focus that we needed to maintain on doing the right thing for our, our students and continue to provide that service. And it was really important that we continue to provide that service because a lot of universities rely on tuition fees. Um, so there was that real need to um, deliver our courses and continue that delivery of the courses. And due to the way in which the recruitment cycle work in higher education, there was also real pressure on continuing to attract prospective students for future intakes. So this is a, um, an overview of the timelines within higher education. So um, it shows the, the various different academic years, so the years where students are studying, but also highlights the fact that overlapping those are recruitment cycles. So at the same time um, as students are studying, um, prospective students are also looking to study in, in future cycles. So during that full lockdown period, um, it was really an important period for us because we were seeing out the 2019 academic year uh, coming to the end of that year and really trying to get those students across the line. But we were also towards the end of the 2021 recruitment cycle. So students who had been looking at going to university for many, many months uh, were now presented with um, uh, the prospect of starting in September to something that was very different to what they'd originally set out to, um, to put themselves forward for. And at the same time, we had that 21-22 recruitment cycle where students would traditionally start looking at university options. And um, again, having that uncertainty. So th there are a lot of um, uh, challenges, there's a lot of uncertainty for universities as to how students would respond from that recruitment perspective, uh, particularly for international students. I think there's that you know, uncertainty in terms of what the university experience would look like in September, concerns around affordability of going to university in a global pandemic and a potential economic recession, um, and also general questions about the value of higher education in, in this new climate. And I think for, for us at the University of East London, these points became really prevalent and really key to our messaging. And we launched a campaign at the beginning of lockdown to reassure our applicants and prospective students that we were still open um, and to provide clarity. And I think this is a really important point that providing clarity of information to them was, was, was really essential at this time because there was so much uncertainty and so much change. In terms of recruitment, there was also um, disruption to, to lead generation and conversion activities. So 
we lost uh, physical events and from a recruitment point of view that's uh, that those events are really important uh, for generating lead and for getting our, our brand out there um, the government response was also uh, shall we say changeable so I think that that gave us um, a lot of challenges in terms of making it difficult um, to, to plan and to forecast and, and also decision making had shifted um, it was just unknown we didn't know how students would respond uh, to what was happening and, and what the future would look like so a lot of uncertainty that said there were, were some factors in our favour from a recruitment perspective um, we know that there was likely to be less employment option for school leavers so recruitment um, to, to higher education then becomes slightly more attractive Travel had stopped, so gap years, anyone considering gap years um, may not have been an option anymore. Um, and we know that older adults may have been uh, out of work because of the pandemic. Um, so looking to reskill or react positively, positively to the pandemic and looking to higher education for that. So looking now at how higher education responded to the pandemic. And I think broadly before the pandemic, um, this was the split of course provision at a standard university. So it was mainly on campus, the lecture hall type experience with physical access to campus facilities, support services, social activities and so on. There may be, have been some kind of online provision, uh, mainly through the sharing of resources of online uh, information and support uh, resources for learning. So obviously this is a very general view uh, for most universities and um, some universities would be more advanced than this, uh, particularly institutions that had online courses. So really just caveat in this as a general view. As we then um, went into full lockdown, the sector pretty much went completely online. And um, I, I think that we actually responded very quickly. I know at the University of East London, um, within a matter of days, we transitioned um, to a fairly seamless online delivery um, that was um, consistent, if not slightly different to the learning provision that our students had had uh, prior to the lockdown. As restrictions lifted, um, that delivery shifted back slightly to on campus um, and that was for um, courses that needed access to facilities and had some level of practical element to them uh, that was challenging to fulfill uh, virtually but there was still a lot of um, online learning still happening because of the restrictions in, in place. I think a really important element of this is the blended element of it, um, of online and on campus. Um, so taking the learnings of the previous months so when we've been purely online delivery to then support that back on campus delivery to provide synchronous delivery model for those unable to access campus and giving them access to a range of resources and interactions in the virtual space. So I think despite huge concerns as to what such a dramatic change might mean to recruitment um, in higher education, the sector actually saw growth in 2020. So participation and accept both increased for the, for, for the sector. And I think there's a few reasons for this. I think Part of it is the demographic increase. So we know that there are more 18 year olds um, in, in the UK in, in the past year. Also the lack of other op opportunities that I, um, that I flagged earlier. And also I think part of it is to do with the positive response uh, from universities, both in that interim solution and uh, being able to provide that online option for students, but also in the communications from the sector. So I think we did a really good job in being clear about what as clear as we could be about what the future would look like and um, how we could support students and what the value and benefits were to students uh, of continuing or deciding to, to take up their uh, study options um, in during a pandemic. So what does the, does the pandemic look like? Um, what does higher education look like um, after the pandemic? And this is the, the model that we just looked at. And I think this is um, purely my view on it, but I feel that we're going to be in um, a place where we're going back to on campus in uh, a slightly more uh, fuller way. So um, the reason I think that we'll be going back to campus is because we need those access to facilities, um, students need social activities, and a big part of the um, student experience is that, that access to campus. Um, I think from a regional, national, international perspective as well, um, there are reasons that a particular location is going to be important to, to students. Um, and working for a London-based institution as I do, 
um, there's that real focus on London as a destination to, for some of our students. So it goes beyond just them having a qualification from a university. It's about the experience and the, um, themselves immersing themselves in a particular location. And whilst I think some universities will be able to trade off of their brand, and their reputation and deliver completely online and to give um, students a, uh, a valuable degree. Um, because of that, I think other students will be looking for that added value from being able to be immersed in a particular location. Um, I also think value for money as well is, is an important point about that return to campus because um, it, it gives students slightly more in terms of what they are, are getting and that perception of value for money. But I think there is going to be this um, increased level of online synchronicity. So really taking what's been learned during the times of fully online learning and applying it to enhance and curate that student experience and allow for an improved product offer. So it's going to continue to allow us to deliver remote access to classes and lectures um, for classes that don't necessarily need to be on campus, um, giving students choice and flexibility uh, for people who can't make it onto campus for personal reasons. And we've seen a lot of that. Um, during the pandemic and it could be that there are elements of that that carry on as we go into the future and also allowing students to revisit and review content as part of that online offer and obviously this will look different for different courses so some courses will rely a lot more on being on campus than others and allow them to flex between the two in a bit more of a synchronous way but probably I feel like this is what it's going to look like going forward. It's also um, interesting to see how the pandemic has opened up a range of opportunities from a marketing and recruitment perspective uh, for higher education. So having to do everything virtually has made universities more quickly, uh, to move more quickly into the virtual space for engaging with prospective students. So whilst virtual tours have been a staple tool for many years now for universities, I think the pandemic has accelerated the development of them and the integration of them with virtual experiences for prospective students. And my prediction is, is that as we go forward, we will have um, a hybrid of uh, physical and virtual events. So I think students will still take the opportunity to visit uh, campuses physically, but also at the same time, um, use the opportunity to, to expand their research um, to be able to engage with other institutions uh, virtually. And I think this very much reflects that shift of consumer behaviour and the advancement of digital literacy that we've seen um, in the course of the pandemic. And I think looking at um, an example such as Santander, they've had um, mobile banking, online banking as a core part of their offer for a long time now, and it's definitely a growth area. But um, the pandemic has really accelerated that in terms of how their customers are using um, those options to the extent that they have recently announced the closure of over 100 physical branches in the UK because their customers in the past 12 months have really um, started to lean towards those um, more virtual and online uh, product offers. So just touching back now on the uh, variations of new product development that we talked about earlier, and how I think that these relate to higher education. So we've clearly seen that uh, renewing an existing product, the pandemic has given us the opportunity to trial fully online and take learning um, and best practice and upskill staff um, and introduce more robust capabilities and infrastructures to provide better products for our students. So it's given them more flexibility and more support. In terms of bringing new products to market, um, I think that it's allowed us to, to think about um, blended learning when we're building new courses and um, building that into our products to take to market rather than trying to retrofit it as we have over the past 12 months. And in terms of introducing a product to a new market, um, I think this is a really interesting area because it's allowed a lot of institutions, a lot of universities to explore online learning in a way that they wouldn't have before. And whilst um, some universities will revert back to that on-campus model that I presented, uh, some universities might take the opportunity to think about actually how can I get our products, our courses um, to students that can't travel to a particular location and, um, and, and do want to engage with us online. So it takes um, that, that product, uh, the, the course offer to a much wider audience. So just to sum up, and I think there's been some really interesting examples here of how, um, how 
businesses, how organizations and how sectors have responded to the pandemic. I think that theme of acceleration of digital, digital transformation and product innovation has been a key one. And the pandemic has, has clearly given us uh, significant challenges, but also that unique opportunity to focus on digital transformation by immersing ourselves fully in the digital space. I think that organizations have had little choice but to invest in this area. So they've upskilled staff, increased digital and virtual capabilities and infrastructures. And I think that we've seen that in the growth of online learning in HE, that product delivery uh, in a virtual space for the hardest hit uh, sectors such as the restaurant um, industry and the airline industry. I think that consumers have become more accustomed to a more digital world and product research and purchasing behavior has shifted. And whilst I think that it's almost certainly going to swing back to some extent, it's going to have opened up the virtual world to a much wider audience. I think the products were forced to adapt to the new world. And while these were generally temporary measures that are unlikely to fully replace that pre-pandemic offer, I think elements of them will no doubt have extended um, uh, the product offer uh, going forward for businesses. I think as a sector, higher education has really risen to the challenge and shown that we can be agile and creative, focusing on the needs of our customers. And we've gone above and beyond to, de to deliver in unprecedented times. And I think we can all take this more courageous way of meeting our customers' needs forward as we look at those more innovative ways to develop our product offer. And I think marketing teams play a key role in that. I think by being strategic and identifying opportunities for growth and innovation, by being insight driven and evidence based, but also learning from the agility and the experimentation that the last 12 months has afforded us and given us that license to take calculated risks and do things differently. And I think by remaining true to brand, so ensuring that as we take new product development forward in the virtual world, that we keep brand purpose at the core of our plans for the future. So that's everything for me. I'll hand back to you now, Judith. Okay, that's great. Thanks very much, David, for a really good presentation. So we're now going to have a short Q&A session. There's still time to submit questions if you want to, and we'll try to get through as many as we can in the next 10 to 15 minutes. And just a reminder, if you're enjoying today's webinar and you want to post on social media, you can use the hashtag CIM events. Um, so the first question, I'm going to combine two of the questions that we've received. Um, do you think that universities can continue to offer value for money while moving to a more virtual model? And then someone else has asked, have you had to differentiate your prices from the physical product to the digital setting? Good, good questions. Yeah, a, a really good point. Um, so I, I think on the on, on the pricing point of it, um, I think the answer is no for now. Um, I think that during the pandemic, universities responded in the best way that they could considering the, the restrictions and I think that um, we managed to develop an offer that was an interim solution and I think that solution um, served its purpose. I think going forward if we're talking about fully online courses for, for a long time for, for the, the duration uh, of a degree then I think that's something that a pricing discussion could be had. Um, but as I said, I kind of see that my prediction is that we're going to go back to that more on, com on campus or more synchronous way of working. And I think that um, the pricing will be less affected by that. Um, apologies, Joseph, what was the first part of the question? Um, it was, do you think universities can continue to offer value for money while moving to more virtual models? And, um, and then it was um, about the differentiation in pri pricing. So I think you probably covered, yeah. covered that. Yeah. I, I think, I mean, de definitely from a, a value for money point of view, I think that's the whole point really um, of, of the presentation. So um, I, I think that it's really not about um, us taking anything away. It's actually us adding to that university experience. So I think that what the pandemic has done is allowed us to experiment in that, in that virtual space and actually add that on in the same way that Coat have as well. If you think about that kind of Coat product offer, um, it's allowed that they will go back to opening up their restaurants, but also it gives their, their uh, customers the opportunity to, to engage with their brand in a different way as well. Okay. Um, and then another question, and, and, and I accept that you said that you see in the long term moving back to the traditional, more traditional model. Uh, but one question we had is in, in the meantime, how do you build trust with students that online courses are as good as bricks and mortar classroom teaching? Um, I'm sort of, I guess they're thinking of people who may be looking at um, starting in this um, coming academic year. 
and they've got to make that decision now. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it's, it's a really good point. And I think um, I, I touched on communication as, as part of the presentation. I think that's been a key part of it for, for us at the University of East London as well. Um, I, I think just really being clear about what that's going to look like. Um, I think that um, being clear about where the added value is, that we're not just um, moving the teaching online and leaving it there. Um, thinking about what else um, what else uh, students expect from their university experience and really trying to build that into that uh, interim offer. So an example would be um, social activities uh, on campus. Obviously, students have access to the, to the student union, the bar, um, to, to social activities and so on. So how can we replicate that in the virtual world whilst these restrictions are in place? Um, and, you know, we, we put on virtual movie nights, virtual um, uh, quizzes and so on. So I, I think that um, it's just being really clear about what the entire package will look like rather than just you're now going to be learning online instead of in a lecture theatre or in a classroom. Sure. Um, next question. Um, do you feel the level of involvement of marketing departments across the UK HE sector in the NPD process is as extensive as it could or should be? Um, yeah, another really good question. I, I think uh, the answer is, is, is that it depends on the institution. So um, I'm lucky enough to, to work in an institution where um, marketing does have a, a voice on, on the executive board. Um, and I think that's a really important uh, distinction between the impacts that we can have as marketing and communications uh, teams. I, I, I think um, having that influence, having that, that voice at the very top level, um, means that we can, we can kind of make a change and make a positive change. Um, I think that in the time that I've worked in higher education, there has been a real shift in um, the professionalism in, um, in marketing teams. And I, I think that um, we, we certainly have the skills and, and, and the, the passion and the, and the courage to be able to do it. So um, as, as long as we've got that process within the institution to be able to have our voice heard, um, then I, I don't see why not. Okay, thanks. Um, and then um, a comment followed by a question um, saying that, um, I, I'm not sure that they mean it, it's great to see it, but I think it's a comparator for the person. Similar challenges in, at UEL because of the, the pandemic. Um, and they're wondering how big a team have been involved in delivering student recruitment campaigns during this time from developing the messaging to ex executing them? Because usually there are a lot of travelling involved, isn't there, to um, international student recruitment? Yeah, um, completely. Yeah, definitely. So I, I think I mean the presentation I mentioned that those um, those kind of physical re recruitment events have have been taken away. Um, I think broadly they've been replaced by virtual recruitment events, and I think um, actually similarly to the way that our courses have kind of transitioned and pivoted to to being online, I think recruitment activities have done the same. So um, in, in some ways it's given us an advantage and. This, I think, is reflected in a lot of different ways that, um, that the pandemic and, and remote, um, remote access has, has, has really moved things forward in that um, we've been able to access bigger audiences. So if you think about this, um, this webinar, for example, if this was a physical webinar, um, not as many people would have been able to attend it. And it's the same with our, our recruitment activities. Um, our, our open days have seen much bigger um, numbers. Um, we can quite easily attend international uh, recruitment events without having to physically travel there and uh, incur the cost and the, the time uh, restraints and resource of that as well. So I think there's been some some real benefits um, of the of the pandemic. Um, it's, it's interesting though because I, I do think there's this um, this kind of paradox of the situation in that it's afforded us this this kind of greater flexibility and this greater reach. But at the same time, I think that um, there's this digital fatigue and a lot of people um, after 12 months of sitting in their bedroom, as I am at the moment, in front of a screen, do want to get out there and start to have those physical um, and in-person interactions. Uh, so I do think that we will shift back to, to some level of um, in-person um, interactions and I think that students will want to go onto campus or go to physical events. Um, it's just the virtual side of it will support that and I, I think that that kind of uh, fits with the overall theme that, that I've been looking at. Yeah, um, next question, um, what about long-term effect on recruitment and enrollment of students who may not like to return to classroom? Um, are you seeing any of that? I mean overall you, you're feeling is that people will want to go back to a more traditional way but what of people who 
aren't able to or perhaps there may be travel restrictions um future. yeah definitely yeah completely I, I think in the short term obviously any kind of travel restrictions um you know are, are a consideration and i think that that's something that um, universities are, are preparing for and and will adapt for and because we've got that experience of the past 12 months we'll be quite easily able to to to, to manage i think in in the the longer term um i, I do think it's unlikely that um there will be as much um want for that but i think where, where where there is that type of demand then there will we will respond and there will be online courses so um and, and you know there are already a, a lot of um online options as well i think pre-pandemic there are institutions that solely focus on that institutions that have started to build that into their models so i i think that the important thing really is us as a, as a sector listening to um our customers our students needs and responding to that and that that's really what um new product development is about right um and i think we've got time for one final question um do you think that big events and they mentioned ucas which for for uh, people who are not in that sector is the central admissions system that we have in the uk for university admissions and higher education recruitment fairs will they pay a large part moving forwards or do you think that smaller events on campus at universities and more digital events like you've just described before will they continue to play a greater role yeah, I, I do honestly think that the physical events will continue to play a, a big role, but I, I think that it will be um, in combination with those, those virtual events. So, um, uh, yeah, it will give people that still want to, to physically uh, visit a, a university or to go to one of those kind of big fairs the opportunity to do so, um, but also then have that kind of wider audience that can't or don't have the appetite to to be able to engage virtually because of the the various different um, kind of infrastructures and, and practices that we've developed over the past 12 months. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you very much, David. Um, that's brilliant. We've had some really good questions there from our viewers. Uh, and just to just to recap, um, as a reminder, CIM is a, a qualifications body as well. Um, and we've had to respond with our offering um, in response to the COVID pandemic as well, um, both in, with our study centre partners who have adapted their teaching methods and, and our assessments. Um, but we also have around 90 plus partner universities who we work in partnership with um, mapping their marketing degrees so that their students can then go on if they wish to to gain exemption from the CIM qualifications later on and we've also developed things as well as this webinar express series we have our marketing club events which are now online to help students develop their skills um, which is webinars and student newsletters and articles that you can register for um, obviously the exemptions that we mentioned from qualifications new modules and we also have the annual pitch competition that you may want to look out for so you can find more information about that on the cim's website and if you want help as a as a an he institution in um getting involved and working with cim in that way we can put you in touch with our our colleagues who can support that. So that's all we have time for for our webinar today. I'd like to say thanks to David for today's presentation and the CIM and Higher, Edu Higher and Further Education Group for organising the event. We do hope you found it interesting and worthwhile. Our next webinar express is Shifting Perceptions of B2B. It's on Thursday, the 3rd of June at 1 p.m. and it is hosted by CIM Northeast. You'll find further details listed on the events page on the CIM website, where you'll also be able to register for the session. So on behalf of CIM, thank you once again, David, for a really good presentation and thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye. <laughs>